stop crying about the male gaze. You know what the male gaze does? The male gaze promotes feminine beauty. And I know that, you know, your fat hens can't handle that. You know, your Mary Sue writers, they can't handle that. Everything has to be dragged down. Everything has to be made ugly so that you feel better about yourself. But you know what? Entertainment is not your therapy. Go get real therapy. Go see a psychiatrist. Oh my God, I'm turning into Doc. Holy shit, where's the Tylenol? People are starting to understand what the DEI plan is. A lot of cases, it's out there to go and steal franchises from fandoms and then essentially just drive the fans out. It's not really about, really about diversity. If you don't think the way these people think, if you don't live your life the way that they want you to live your life, they don't want you to be a part of it. Yet they keep going out there and acquiring these IPs and these franchises, uh, despite the fact that they're directly at odds with basically the fandom. Back when uh, your boy Zach started his channel, he talked about how uh, this was all about capturing critical nodes and infrastructure to push an agenda. And it turned out that uh, history has proven him right. You know, Neon uh, from Clownfish TV, he posted a, uh, a tweet the other day where he was talking about how they want D&D without Gary Gygax. They want the X-Men without Stanley and Jack Kirby. They want, you know, they, they want to claim all these things. They want to take them over. And, uh, you know, I responded that, uh, you know, evil cannot create, it can only destroy. And that's what this agenda is. It's about taking these critical nodes and infrastructure and transforming them, these beloved properties, into propaganda. So, you know, they know that they're never going to be able to get these ideas across uh, without taking something that's already popular and hollowing it out and stuffing it full of all of this, uh, all of this ESG bullshit. And another thing it's definitely about is changing the culture, not so much within the fandom. They just want to drive you out, but they want to change the culture within the companies and the people that are associated with the IP so that it's changed forever. We've certainly seen that with Disney. They changed almost overnight. You know, we had a, a focus now almost exclusively on DEI over the last five years. And shockingly, we've seen all their franchises basically deflate and become uh, somewhat toxic to the fandoms that have loved them so, so much time. And to expand upon that, we actually heard recently in like a DEI, uh, some type of a meeting talking about the achievements and what they, their goals are. And this is what Warner Brothers Discovery Chief Diversity equity and inclusion officer Asif Sadiq called on companies to ignore any employees who might disagree with DEI ideology and instead focus on the ones who want to change because that way you start changing the culture. And if you change culture, often these people who don't want to come around will start saying this place isn't the way that it used to be and they'll leave themselves, which is great. It's all about gaining the culture, changing the culture, because once you set the new culture, it's very, very, very difficult to change it. Yeah, it absolutely is. And we've seen how quickly that that can hollow out a company and destroy it. Uh, Disney, Pixar, um, you know, these they, they forced out John Lasseter. When John Lasseter left, he took uh, a lot of the talented people with him, the people that had actually been the, the beating heart of Pixar and the creativity behind it. And they installed Jennifer Lee and her move. Uh, we know from the Disney files uh, that's being done over um, on the. Uh, on Chris Gore's channel, Film Threat. Uh, you know, they've had a lot of uh, little exposés on there that have uh, have revealed what's going on internally. Jennifer Lee hired a bunch of diverse peoples from Tumblr and, and uh, you know, all of these people that were online that fit all these checkboxes. But it came in and it turned out that drawing cartoons on Tumblr did not mean you knew how to be an animator, did not know that you knew how to construct a story, did not know that you knew how to tell a story with heart that would resonate with an audience. And within a few years, Pixar is completely destroyed. It has no reputation anymore. And Pixar under John Laster for the longest time was the gold standard. You could go to a Pixar movie and you knew that it was going to be good, that you were going to enjoy it. I went to see Up. I had no idea what that movie was about. I had just seen some posters. and uh, But I was like, oh, new Pixar movie. And I went and I, I you know, absolutely loved it because it was being run by people who knew what they were doing. So what you've got is you've just got a bunch of people who, you know, they like the stuff and they want to be a part of it, but they haven't actually done any of the work to know how to do these things. And those are the people, you know, the lunatics are running the asylum now. And, you know, you've seen it destroy Disney in short order. You know, all of the brand of the brand of brands, Star Wars, have been brought low by Kathleen Kennedy and the type of people that she hired. You know, that that was a license to print money. And Disney has destroyed it within 10 years. Pixar's probably been destroyed within the last six years. Uh, Marvel destroyed in the last four years all because of these initiatives, all because of these activists within the company that aren't about entertaining, they're about propaganda. And it's one of the weird things is it's, uh, it's a change in almost corporate structure around uh, the world. You know, you have your chief operating officer, you have your chief creative officer, you know, you have these C-level positions to where you're an executive. Well, now you have your chief diversity officer and they're up there and they're part of the corporate structure 
just as powerful as the other people, in some places more powerful. And now they're setting the agenda for the entire company. And they're going out there and they're hiring people that believe exactly what uh, they have to believe to get into those jobs. And they're placing them all over these companies and really destroying the fabric of the culture. Once you get somebody in there and they get that C-suite position, that, that chief diversity officer position, and they're making you know 350000 maybe half a million dollars a year setting this agenda within the company, do you think these people are ever going to go away? They cannot be driven out because they'll just sue the hell of the company say that they're being discriminated against. A lot of these companies almost have basically went out there and hired the cancer that will kill them. Yeah, they've welcomed it in. Uh, Congratulations, you've let the barbarians in the gates. Uh, Disney fired Victoria Alonso. She was incredibly terrible at her job. She was promoted beyond her level of, uh, you know, her level of effectiveness. She was put in charge of the visual effects. Under her, the visual effects became terrible. Terrible. The visual effects houses started to not want to work with Marvel uh, because of the, you know, reportedly the uh, the harsh working conditions and the absolute tyrant that she was. And uh, and so Disney fired her. And then what happened? She sued them because, you know, she was a gay woman of color and that, you know, you can't fire her. She's that's discrimination. So she sued them. And obviously they don't want to go through discovery. So, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to settle with her. She's going to get a big million dollar payout. Well, congratulations. This is what you've done to yourself, you know, and unfortunately for the rest of us, for the people that love the IP and the franchises and and love the vision of what Disney was under Walt, uh, you know, and who grew up with that, uh, that company is gone. That company no longer exists. And in our hearts, we still yearn for it. We still yearn for Star Wars to be good. We still, you know, want, you know, we still love Marvel characters. But all of the things that we love are gone. And this is why I've never worried about uh, whether or not I've made Tom Brevoort's list of people never to hire, you know, which he's talked about on on more than one occasion. Because the Marvel that I would have liked to have worked for, the Marvel that I would have wanted to contribute to is dead. And all that's left is a husk parading around in its skin. Yeah, because we've had these corporations go basically go around and start buying up all these IPs. They actively hate the fandom that comes along with it. And in a lot of cases are doing everything they can to drive them away. Uh, case in point, Dungeons & Dragons senior game designer Jason Tondro said, There are materials in the original Dungeons & Dragons that would never pass our inclusivity reviews today. Some of it you can understand like, okay, these are a bunch of war gamers and they're using armies from history. So when they create a warrior class for Dungeons and Dragons, they call it the fighting man, the original name for the fighters class, because that's what they were used to. They were all men. They were all white dudes from Lake Geneva and Twin Cities. And I hate to break it to Mr. Tondro, but you're also just a white dude. But it it offends him what Dungeons and Dragons basically origins are. It upsets him. And I wonder to myself, why would you quit your job and go and work for Wizards of the Coast and be the senior game designer for Dungeons and Dragons? If you don't like the material, if you don't like the fandom, if you don't like what Dungeons and Dragons has always been about, if it's so offensive, why would you want to be a part of it? Because it's a cultural touchstone and he can go in there and he can try to alter it and make it what he wants it to be. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter that he doesn't love it or he doesn't even like it and that he thinks that, uh, you know, it's not inclusive enough, you know. Uh, well, look, hey, if Dungeons and Dragons isn't inclusive enough for you as a, as a player, go play something else. Not everything has to bend to your will, to your desires, to your fandom. That's exactly the problem is is people come in and they don't care about the IP. It's just about taking it and transforming it into something else. So you get a guy like this in there, you know, and he's like, I'm going to make it more inclusive. This corporatization is the death of everything. So as soon as you have a corporate structure come in and they take over an IP and they say to themselves, well, we need to make more money. How can we do that? We need to increase the audience. How do we do that? We make it more inclusive. We make it for everybody. And you see, you see companies do this all the time. They'll say comics are for everybody or, you know, um, Warhammer is for everybody. Now, f- fortunately, Warhammer is not saying that yet. But, you know, with the uh, the continued pressure, uh, it may eventually happen. And that's what Warhammer fans are afraid of. Uh, but, you know, you've got all of these attempts to make something for everybody. Well, guess what? Nothing is for everybody. It's for anybody who's interested in the thing that it is. So, you know, hey, do you like G.I. Joe? Then guess what? This new G.I. Joe comic is for you. But if you don't like G.I. Joe, you don't like stories about the, you know, about military men fighting a, a terrorist threat, then no, this isn't for you. And we're not, you know, and you can't come in here and be like, well, I like My Little Pony. Can you make G.I. Joe more like My Little Pony so that I like it too? 
Once you start trying to make something for everybody, you end up making something for nobody. And that's what Star Wars is now. Star Wars is made for nobody. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is rapidly becoming for nobody. And it's because they turn their backs on the people that it's actually for, the people that actually like it, and they start trying to market it to somebody else. And Dungeons of the Dragons is such a weird example because it's always been maybe the most inclusive thing ever. Like, you can literally be anything that you want. There is a framework of the rules, but you can be whatever gender or whatever type of warrior you want to be. You don't even have to be a warrior to play within the confines of the rules of the game. You can go and do any adventure that you want that's in, within the realm of your imagination. And I just think it kind of sucks because, for the most part, people that play Dungeons & Dragons have not been portrayed well over the years, you know, in pop culture and entertainment, all that kind of stuff. And I imagine there are thousands of, of dudes across the world that grew up playing Dun Dungeons and Dragons and got the shit beat out of them over it. And this guy is just basically spit in their face like, nah, well, you guys are all white dudes. And that was a problem from the very beginning. And we're going to go out there and make something that was completely inclusive to begin with, more inclusive by making you not like it anymore. Wes, uh, you know, HBO had that show, The L Word, which was uh, made for lesbians. Uh, you know, and, and guys that want to watch lesbians, I guess. But, uh, you know, it was primarily made for a lesbian audience. Um, you didn't see me like going in there and going like, well, I don't even like this show. I don't have any interest in this show. But uh, you know what? I want to come in here and I want to make it more inclusive. I want to make it, uh, you know, just, just appealing to lesbians. You know, that's not enough of an audience. Let's uh, let's make this appeal to everybody. Uh, you know, how can we do that? It's okay for things to be made for a certain audience. It's okay for a property to find an audience that is mostly white males. It's okay for an audience to find, an, you know, for a property to find an audience that's mostly black guys. It's okay, you know, for these things to appeal to a majority demographic. There'll always be outliers. Star Wars was primarily a boy's property. There were a lot of girls that were into it. But once you started trying to socially engineer it so that it was specifically for girls, guess what? You turned off the male audience. And boys walked away. Boys don't want to play with Star Wars anymore. And you know what? Girls don't want to play with Star Wars either. Yeah, there's a few. But you didn't replace that male audience. And you certainly didn't capture that female audience that you were looking for. So congratulations. It's now a property for nobody. The only people that it's for are for the idiots that spaz out about every little thing on Twitter. And uh, you know are determined to go down with the ship. It's just weird that it, it does seem to almost 100% target the male audience, straight male audience for the most part. You don't see there people going out there and be like, man, Barbie just really needs to be more, you know, inclusive. We need to get some fighting class, uh, you know, action figures in Barbie. You know, we need to really change what Rainbow Bright was to open it up to a more of a male demographic. It almost feels like it's like 100 percent always things that are traditionally enjoyed by males like dudes. Yeah. And it's because, you know, there's a larger uh, there's a larger attempt to socially engineer uh, so that, uh, you know, boys are less, you know, talk less filled with toxic masculinity. They want to feminize all of the men. And, uh, you know, if you want to get into conspiracy theories, I think that there's a larger effort just to feminize men so that, uh, you know, they're docile. There's less of a pushback uh, when, uh, you know, when you have uh, these, th this tyranny that everybody's trying to usher in the world over. Uh, you know, they, they want us feminized. They want us demoralized. They want us weak. And part of demoralizing a culture is taking away their entertainment, taking away escapism, and just making everything the same relentless slog that is regular life. 1984 is a playbook for these people. You know, it was written as a cautionary tale, but, uh, you know, Orwell knew what he was doing. But if we're so toxic and we're such assholes, why do you want all our shit? So that they can uh, take it away from us because we need to be punished for being so toxic. Well, our latest example or the last example we'll talk about comes from the Red Sonia movie star Matilda Lutz. And this is what she says about the film. So what I can tell you about Red Sonia is that the first ones in the comics were made with a very male gaze orientation. This is a completely different story and it's very woman empowered, which I loved about the script. Uh, details as to the Red Sonia's exact plot currently remain under wraps. But according to a summation of director M.J. Bassett's words, the film will be an allegory for more existential questions around the survival of the species in the face of climate change. Like, can you get any further away from what fucking Red Sonja is than that? So climate change in the Hyborian age, huh? That's what we're <laughs> exactly. going to do? I, I, if you don't like characters that were created for the male gaze, don't play Red Sonja. It's not that stop. hard. Stop trying to convert us all to your retarded weather religion stop it make a red sonia movie it's already a story of female empowerment 
It is a warrior yeah, woman like who kicks Bridget wholesale Nielsen. ass. Yeah. It's already as empowering as it can be. And by the way, it's one of the few instances where men will accept a woman beating the shit out of much larger men because she's Red Sonia. She's a badass. She is a warrior. You don't need to make it. Uh, you need to be more empowering. But oh, get out of here. Go make something else. This is going to appeal. It's not going to appeal to men, and it's not going to appeal to women. You guys have tried but, this again and again and again. You try to make women men, and it does not appeal to the female audience. You know who saw Captain Marvel? Mostly men. You know why? Because even though it was a piece of steaming dog shit, it was a superhero film, and superhero films appeal to men. Women didn't go see it. They're not buying what you're selling. They're not buying your L.A. grievance box wine drinking version of womanhood that only appeals to you and your weirdo friends in Hollywood. It does not appeal to a mass audience. Stop it. You're going to waste the studio's money. You're going to make this franchise radioactive for the next 25 years, and no one will be able to do anything with Red Sonia again for that time until it comes back around. And then whatever lunatic social experimentation that you people are trying to push gets stuffed into that version. And they're going to blame us for not going to see it. We're like, well, you know, Red Sonia typically, you know, has uh, got some big tits and got a pretty nice outfit on her, and you, you covered her up. It wasn't even Red Sonia. Chainmail bikini and, and kicking all kinds of ass. That's that's Red Sonia. Fierce warrior woman, chainmail bikini, sex appeal, while also just, you know, tearing through dudes with a sword. That's that's the sort of thing that we like. That Yeah, that is that part of the male gaze? Yeah, that appeals to the male gaze. You know what? It also appeals to the female gaze. Women like looking at sexy women, even if they're straight. They like sexy women art. They line up for J. Scott Campbell at his booth at uh, you know at comic conventions. That line is at least half, if not majority, women most of the time, and they're straight and they just like his art because they like looking at pretty things. Stop trying to rob us of beauty. Stop trying. Stop crying about the male gaze. You know what the male gaze does? The male gaze promotes feminine beauty. And I know that you know you fat hens can't handle that. You know your Mary Sue writers they can't handle that. Everything has to be dragged down. Everything has to be made ugly so that you feel better about yourself. But you know what? Entertainment is not your therapy. Go get real therapy. Go see a psychiatrist. Oh my God, I'm turning into Doc. Holy shit, where's the Tylenol? I don't know, buddy, but we couldn't get it as Xena Warrior Princess anymore. It's too sexy. <laughs> too sexy? It's, you know, sexiness is not allowed. And yet, what did we go through recently? The uh, the Sydney Sweeney discussion, where it's like, you know, everybody's like, sexy is back. Because Sydney Sweeney, you know, enjoys being a woman, and she enjoys dressing up. She enjoys uh, taking the twins out for a walk. <laughs> you know, like, this is... Uh... It's what just do, the, what the do these pull. DEI people enjoy? It doesn't seem like they enjoy any of the stuff that, the, that they're hired on to do. Do they just enjoy breaking all that shit and driving people off? Yeah, yeah, that's what they enjoy. They enjoy taking things away from people. They are just the, the most bitter and unhappy people. There's no joy in their life. Uh, all they can do is just the same tired trope. And if you would have told me that this article came out of 2018, you know, these comments, I would have actually believed it because this is such a 2018 point of view. You know, you're you're talking about Red Sonia, and you're just going to repeat all of the failures that we've seen of the last five years, the six years. Um, you've learned nothing. Uh, and uh, congratulations on your big uh, multi-million dollar flop. I can't wait for you guys to lose money and then blame us for not going to see it. You want me to go see a movie? Make something that I want to see. It's not that hard. That would be the, the key there, Aaron. Now, you and I have already talked about X-Men 97 and all the controversy brewing around there. But we've got at least another hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes to go talk about pop culture and comic books and all that stuff here on the Geek Fix, exclusive to Thinking Critical Patreon. Absolutely. You know, guys, come along with the, with the ride. You know, occasionally we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about things that you're interested in, but mostly we'll talk about things that occur to Wes and I in the moment. 